Good, good morning, everybody. I'm standing in front of you as a law teacher because years ago when we had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, I went and apologized as president of the Law Teachers Society of South Africa to Archbishop Tutu to say never again would the law schools remain silent when human rights were being violated in South Africa. Apart from our colleague Yusuf Vada here and one of my other junior colleagues, there isn't a big turnout from our law faculty. I'm not sure what's happened in the other provinces, but one of my missions is going to be to mobilize all those law schools again and get them actively involved in protecting human rights. <laughs> I'm here to protest against the treatment of our Minister of Finance for three reasons. The first one is that what happened to him is what lawyers call malicious prosecution. I'll explain that to you shortly. The second one is obviously I support his campaign against torture. And the third one, uh, tortures, to, torture for the people in the poor areas, not his campaign against torture, his campaign against corruption. And the last one is his campaign against preventing transnational crime. On the question of someone being maliciously prosecuted, just to explain it to you, there are three requirements. The first one is that you have to have acted maliciously for someone to be prosecuted. The other one is that you've got to have no reasonable and probable cause. And the third one is that the, the proceedings must have terminated in your favor. Now, I want to go with reasonable and probable cause first, because even a very junior prosecutor would know that you do not charge anyone with a crime if you don't have any evidence. The fact that you start doing it when you have no evidence and you have to find the evidence afterwards, as happened in that SARS hostage drama, that clearly shows that there was no reasonable and probable cause to actually charge the minister. The second one is that you've got to have acted maliciously, which means that you don't have an honest belief in the person's guilt or you act from an improper motive. If we see what happened to our minister, the first time they charged him with a so-called rogue unit, they chose to do it while he was busily trying to promote the economic interests of our country overseas and elsewhere to prevent us being relegated to junk status. That clearly was malicious. The second charge, even though at a meeting with the President and the Minister of Justice two weeks before, they waited until the day before he was due to give his budget speech and they charged him then. That again is clearly malice. The third thing is that we heard a couple of days ago the charges have been withdrawn. So our minister, if he wanted to, could sue the National Director of Public Prosecutions and anyone else who was instrumental in those charges for malicious prosecution. And he could claim not only damages for anything to his pocket, but also for the hurt and, and the insecurity and the pressure that was put upon him as well. If he does decide to sue him or any of his colleagues, they should do so on the basis that the national prosecutor and the rest of them pay out of their own pockets and do not pay with taxpayers' money. <laughs> the second point I want to mention is corruption. Um, we heard a couple of days ago the, the president saying, I cannot interfere with this prosecution because it would reduce us to a banana republic. Well, if we look at our president's record, he actually has set us on the road to Banana Republic. He abolished the Scorpions. He has a family that supports him and is engaged in what we call state cult, uh, capture. He also has his family and relatives benefiting and his cronies in government. That clearly is, is corruption. He has also allowed people to come to a wedding and use a key point, a military aerodrome, for the guests to land, and then made sure they had an escort to get out. He violates our international obligations by not arresting, having someone arrested, and giving false information to the courts that the person they didn't know where the person was, so that that person who's known to be someone who has created genocide in his country gets away. And then lastly, what he has now done is he started to trash President Mandela's legacy to the international community, and that is to get us to withdraw from the International Criminal Court. All of these things are firmly setting us on the road to a banana republic, and it's time for us to stand up and stop that. 
The last thing I want to talk about is transnational crime. Again, I support here the minister's efforts in this regard. We've seen that he's um, <coughs> made an affidavit to the court listing all the things that the Guptas are suspected of doing in terms of financial transactions. We heard from one of the Guptas' private security people that canvas bags full of money were being flown out of the country in their private aircraft. Lastly, the Guptas are doing well. They have bought a 445 million rand house in Dubai, and they're building a 200 million rand temple in their hometown. All of this tells us that a lot of money has been getting out of this country, and how it has been getting out, we don't know. So at the end of the day, I'm here to support the minister in these three things, and I want to try and make my contribution as well.